Chapter One of the Human Machine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. Chapter One: Taking Oneself for Granted. There are men who are capable of loving a machine more deeply than they can love a woman. They are among the happiest men on earth. This is not a sneer meanly shot from cover at women. It is simply a statement of notorious fact. Men who worry themselves to distraction over the perfecting of a machine are indubitably blessed beyond their kind. Most of us have known such men. Yesterday they were constructing motor cars, but today aeroplanes are in the air, or at any rate they ought to be, according to the inventors. Watch the inventors. Invention is not usually their principal business. They must invent in their spare time. They must invent before breakfast, invent in the strand between Lyons's and the office, invent after dinner, invent on Sundays see with what ardour they rush home of a night see how they seize a half-holiday like hungry dogs a bone they don't want golf bridge limericks novels illustrated magazines clubs whisky starting prices hints about neckties political meetings yarns comic songs and turic salts nor the smiles that are situate between a gay corsage and a picture hat. They never wonder at a loss what they will do next. Their evenings never drag, are always too short. You may, indeed, catch them at twelve o'clock at night on the flat of their backs, but not in bed. No, in a shed, under a machine, holding a candle whose paths drop fatness, up to the connecting rod that is strained or the wheel that is out of centre they are continually interested nay enthralled they have a machine and they are perfecting it they get one part right and then another goes wrong and they get that right and then another goes wrong and so on when they are quite sure they have reached perfection, forth issues the machine out of the shed, and in five minutes is smashed up, together with a limb or so of the inventors, just because they had been quite sure too soon. Then the whole business starts again. They do not give up. That particular wreck was, of course, due to a mere oversight the whole business starts again for they have glimpsed perfection they have the gleam of perfection in their souls thus their lives run away they will never fly you remark cynically well if they don't besides what about right with all your cynicism, have you never envied them their machine and their passionate interest in it? You know, perhaps, the moment when, brushing in front of the glass, you detected your first grey hair. You stopped brushing. Then you resumed brushing hastily. You pretended not to be shocked. But you were... Perhaps you know a more disturbing moment than that, the moment when it suddenly occurred to you that you had arrived as far as you ever will arrive, and you had realised as much of your early dream as you ever will realise, and the realisation was utterly unlike the dream. The marriage was excessively prosaic and eternal, not at all what you expected it to be, and your illusions were dissipated, and games and hobbies had an unpleasant core of tedium and futility, and the ideal tobacco mixture did not exist, and one literary masterpiece resembled another, and all the days that are to come will more or less resemble the present day until you die, and in an illuminating flash 
you understood what all those people were driving at when they wrote such unconscionably long letters to the telegraph as to life being worth living or not worth living and there was naught to be done but face the grey monotonous future and pretend to be cheerful with the worm of ennui gnawing at your heart in a word the moment when it occurred to you that yours is the common lot in that moment have you not wished do not continually wish for an exhaustless machine a machine that you could never get to the end of would you not give your head to be lying on the flat of your back peering with a candle dirty foiled catching cold but absorbed in the pursuit of an object have you not gloomily regretted that you were born without a mechanical turn because there is really something about a machine it has never struck you that you do possess a machine oh blind oh dull it has never struck you that you have at hand a machine wonderful beyond all mechanisms in sheds intricate delicately adjustable of astounding and miraculous possibilities interminably interesting that machine is yourself this fellow is preaching i won't have it you exclaim resentfully dear sir i am not preaching and even if i were i think you would have it i think i can anyhow keep hold of your button for a while though you pull hard i am not preaching i am simply bent on calling your attention to a fact which has perhaps wholly or partially escaped you namely that you are the most fascinating bit of machinery that ever was you do yourself less than justice it is said that men are only interested in themselves the truth is that as a rule men are interested in every mortal thing except themselves they have a habit of taking themselves for granted and that habit is responsible for nine-tenths of the boredom and despair on the face of the planet a man will wake up in the middle of the night usually owing to some form of delightful excess and his brain will be very active indeed for a space ere he can go to sleep again in that candid hour after the exaltation of the evening and before the hope of the dawn he will see everything in its true colours except himself there is nothing like a sleepless couch for a clear vision of one's environment he will see all his wife's faults and the hopelessness of trying to cure them he will momentarily see though with less sharpness of outline his own faults he will probably decide that the anxieties of children outweigh the joys connected with children he will admit all the shortcomings of existence will face them like a man grimly sourly in a sturdy despair he will mutter of course i'm angry who wouldn't be of course i'm disappointed did i expect this twenty years ago yes we ought to save more but we don't so there you are i'm bound to worry i know i should be better if i didn't smoke so much i know there's absolutely no sense at all in taking liqueurs absurd to be ruffled with her when she's in one of her moods i don't have enough exercise can't be regular somehow not the slightest use hoping that things will be different because i know they won't queer world never really what you may call happy you know now if things were different he loses consciousness observe he has taken himself for granted just glancing at his faults and looking away again it is his environment that has occupied his attention and his environment things that he would wish to have different did he not know out of the fullness of experience that it is futile to desire such a change 
what he wants is a pipe that won't put itself into his mouth a glass that won't leap of its own accord to his lips money that won't slip untouched out of his pocket legs that without asking will carry him certain miles every day in the open air habits that practice themselves a wife that will expand and contract according to his humours like a vernica bookcase always complete but never finished wise man he perceives at once that he can't have these things and so he resigns himself to the universe and settles down to a permanent restrained discontent no one shall say he is unreasonable you see he has given no attention to the machine let us not call it a flying machine let us call it simply an automobile there it is on the road jolting screeching rattling perfuming and there he is saying this road ought to be as smooth as velvet that hill in front is ridiculous and the descent on the other side positively dangerous and it's all turns i can't see a hundred yards in front he has a wild idea of trying to force the county council to sandpaper the road or of employing the new territorial army to remove the hill but he dismisses that idea he is so reasonable he accepts all he sits clothed in reasonableness on the machine and accepts all ass you exclaim why doesn't he get down and inflate that tire for one thing any one can see the sparking apparatus is wrong and it's perfectly certain the gearbox wants oil why doesn't he i will tell you why he doesn't just because he isn't aware that he is on a machine at all he has never examined what he is on and at the back of his consciousness is a dim idea that he is perched on a piece of solid immutable rock that runs on casters End of chapter 1chapter two of the human machine by arnold bennett this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two amateurs in the art of living considering that we have to spend the whole of our lives in this human machine considering that it is our sole means of contact and compromise with the rest of the world we really do devote to it very little attention when i say we i mean our inmost spirits the instinctive part the mystery within that exists and when i say the human machine i mean the brain and the body and chiefly the brain the expression of the soul by means of the brain and body is what we call the art of living we certainly do not learn this art at school to any appreciable extent at school we are taught that it is necessary to fling our arms and legs to and fro for so many hours per diem we are also shown practically that our brains are capable of performing certain useful tricks and that if we do not compel our brains to perform those tricks we shall suffer thus one day we run home and proclaim to our delighted parents that eleven twelves are one hundred and thirty-two a feat of the brain so it goes on until our parents begin to look up to us because we can chatter of cosines or sketch the foreign policy of louis the fourteenth good but not a word about the principles of the art of living yet only a few detached rules from our parents to be blindly followed when particular crises supervene and indeed it would be absurd to talk to a schoolboy about the expression of his soul he would probably mutter a monosyllable which is not mice of course school is merely a preparation for living unless one goes to a university in which case it is a preparation for university one is supposed to turn one's attention to living when these preliminaries are over say at the age of about twenty assuredly one lives then 
there is however nothing new in that for one has been living all the time in a fashion all the time one has been using the machine without understanding it but does one school and college being over enter upon a study of the machine not a bit the question then becomes not how to live but how to obtain and retain a position in which one will be able to live how to get minute portions of dead animals and plants which one can swallow in order not to die of hunger how to acquire and constantly renew a stock of other portions of dead animals and plants in which one can envelop oneself in order not to die of cold how to procure the exclusive right of entry into certain huts where one may sleep and eat without being rained upon by the clouds of heaven and so forth and when one has realized this ambition there comes the desire to be able to double the operation and do it not for oneself alone but for oneself and another marriage but no scientific sustained attention is yet given to the real business of living of smooth intercourse of self-expression of conscious adaptation to environment in brief to the study of the machine at thirty the chances are that a man will understand better the draught of a chimney than his own respiratory apparatus to name one of the simple obvious things and as for understanding the working of his own brain what an idea as for the skill to avoid the waste of power involved by friction in the business of living do we give an hour to it in a month do we ever at all examine it save in an amateurish and clumsy fashion a young lady produces a water-colour drawing very nice we say and add to ourselves for an amateur but our living is more amateurish than that young lady's drawing though surely we ought every one of us to be professionals at living when we have been engaged in the preliminaries to living for about fifty-five years we begin to think about slacking off up till this period our reason for not having scientifically studied the art of living the perfecting and use of the finer parts of the machine is not that we have lacked leisure most of us have enormous heaps of leisure but that we have simply been too absorbed in the preliminaries have in fact treated the preliminaries to the business as the business itself then at fifty-five we ought at last to begin to live our lives with professional skill as a professional painter paints pictures yes but we can't it is too late then neither painters nor acrobats nor any professionals can be formed at the age of fifty-five thus we finish our lives amateurishly as we have begun them and when the machine creaks and sets our teeth on edge or refuses to obey the steering wheel and deposits us in the ditch we say can't be helped or doesn't matter it will all be the same a hundred years hence or i must make the best of things and we try to believe that in accepting the status quo we have justified the status quo and all the time we feel our insincerity you exclaim that i exaggerate i do to force into prominence an aspect of affairs usually overlooked it is absolutely necessary to exaggerate poetic license is one name for this kind of exaggeration but i exaggerate very little indeed much less than perhaps you think i know that you are going to point out to me that vast numbers of people regularly spend a considerable portion of their leisure in striving after self-improvement granted and i am glad of it but i should be gladder if their strivings bore more closely upon the daily business of living of self-expression without friction and without futile desires see this man who regularly studies every evening of his life he has genuinely understood the nature of poetry and his taste is admirable 
he recites verse with true feeling and may be said to be highly cultivated poetry is a continual source of pleasure to him true but why is he always complaining about not receiving his deserts in the office why is he worried about finance why does he so often sulk with his wife why does he persist in eating more than his digestion will tolerate it was not written in the book of fate that he should complain and worry and sulk and suffer and if he was a professional at living he would not do these things there is no reason why he should do them except the reason that he has never learnt his business never studied the human machine as a whole never really thought rationally about living supposing you encountered an automobilist who was swerving and grinding all over the road and you stopped to ask what was the matter and he replied never mind what's the matter just look at my lovely acetylene lamps how they shine and how i've polished them you would not regard him as a clifford earp or even as an entirely sane man so with our student of poetry it is indubitable that a large amount of what is known as self-improvement is simply self-indulgence a form of pleasure which only incidentally improves a particular part of the machine and even that to the neglect of far more important parts my aim is to direct a man's attention to himself as a whole considered as a machine complex and capable of quite extraordinary efficiency for travelling through this world smoothly in any desired manner with satisfaction not only to himself but to the people he meets en route and the people who are overtaking him and whom he is overtaking my aim is to show that only an inappreciable fraction of our ordered and sustained efforts is given to the business of actual living as distinguished from the preliminaries to living End of chapter two chapter three of the human machine by arnold bennett this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the brain as a gentleman at large it is not as if in this business of daily living we were seriously hampered by ignorance either as to the results which we ought to obtain or as to the general means which we must employ in order to obtain them with all our absorption in the mere preliminaries to living and all our carelessness about living itself we arrive pretty soon at a fairly accurate notion of what satisfactory living is and we perceive with some clearness the methods necessary to success i have pictured the man who wakes up in the middle of the night and sees the horrid semi-fiasco of his life but let me picture the man who wakes up refreshed early on a fine summer morning and looks into his mind with the eyes of hope and experience not experience and despair that man will pass a delightful half-hour in thinking upon the scheme of the universe as it affects himself he is quite clear that contentment depends on his own acts and that no power can prevent him from performing those acts he plans everything out and before he gets up he knows precisely what he must and will do in certain foreseen crises and junctures he sincerely desires to live efficiently who would wish to make a daily mess of existence and he knows the way to realize the desire and yet mark me that man will not have been an hour on his feet on this difficult earth before the machine has unmistakably gone wrong the machine which was designed to do this work of living which is capable of doing it thoroughly well but which has not been put into order what is the use of consulting the map of life and tracing the itinerary and getting the machine out of the shed and making a start if half the nuts are loose or the steering pillar is twisted 
or there is no petrol in the tank? Having asked this question, I will drop the mechanico-vehicular comparison, which is too rough and crude for the delicacy of the subject. Where has the human machine gone wrong? It has gone wrong in the brain. What, is he wrong in the head? Most assuredly, most strictly. He knows, none better, that when his wife employs a particular tone containing ten grains of asperity, and he replies in a particular tone containing eleven grains, the consequences will be explosive. He knows, on the other hand, that if he replies in a tone containing only one little drop of honey, the consequences may not be unworthy of two reasonable beings. He knows this. His brain is fully instructed. And, lo, his brain, while arguing that women are really too absurd, as if that was the point, is sending down orders to the muscles of the throat and mouth which result in at least eleven grains of asperity, and conjugal relations are endangered for the day. He didn't want to do it. His desire was not to do it. He despises himself for doing it. But his brain was not in working order. His brain ran away, raced on its own account, against reason, against desire, against morning resolves, and there he is. That is just one example of the simplest and slightest. Examples can be multiplied. The man may be a young man whose immediate future depends on his passing an examination, an examination which he is capable of passing on his head, which nothing can prevent him from passing if only his brain will not be so absurd as to give orders to his legs to walk out of the house towards the tennis court instead of sending them upstairs to the study. If only, having once safely lodged him in the study, his brain will devote itself to the pages of books instead of dwelling on the image of a nice girl, not at all like other girls. Or the man may be an old man who will live in perfect comfort if only his brain will not interminably run round and round in a circle of grievances, apprehensions, and fears which no amount of contemplation can destroy or even ameliorate. The brain, the brain, that is the seat of trouble. Well, you say, of course it is, we all know that. We don't act as if we did, anyway. Give us more brains, Lord ejaculated a great writer. Personally, I think he would have been wiser if he had asked first for the power to keep in order such brains as we have. We indubitably possess quite enough brains, quite as much as we can handle. The supreme muddlers of living are often people of quite remarkable intellectual faculty, with a quite remarkable gift of being wise for others. The pity is that our brains have a way of wandering, as it is politely called. Brain-wandering is indeed now recognised as a specific disease. I wonder what you, O oh businessman with an office in Ludgate Circus, would say to your office-boy, whom you had dispatched on an urgent message to Westminster, and whom you found larking around Euston Station when you rushed to catch your weekend train. "'Please, sir, I started to go to Westminster, "'but there's something funny in my limbs "'that makes me go up all manner of streets. "'I can't help it, sir.' "'Can't you?' you would say. "'Well, you had better go and be somebody else's office boy.' "'Your brain is something worse than that office boy, "'something more insidiously potent for evil.' I conceive the brain of the average well-intentioned man as possessing the tricks and manners of one of those gentlemen at large who, having nothing very urgent to do, stroll along and offer their services gratis to some short-handed work of philanthropy. They will commonly demoralise and disorganise the business conduct of an affair in about a fortnight. They come when they like, they go when they like. Sometimes they are exceedingly industrious and obedient, but then there is an even chance that they will shirk and follow their own sweet will. And they mustn't be spoken to or pulled up, 
for have they not kindly volunteered and are they not giving their days for naught these persons are the bane of the enterprises in which they condescend to meddle now there is a vast deal too much of the gentleman at large about one's brain one's brain has no right whatever to behave as a gentleman at large but it in fact does it forgets it flatly ignores orders at the critical moment when pressure is highest it simply lights a cigarette and goes out for a walk and we meekly sit down under this behaviour i didn't feel like stewing says the young man who against his wish will fail in his examination the words were out of my mouth before i knew it says the husband whose wife is a woman i couldn't get any inspiration to-day says the artist i can't resist stilton says the fellow who is dying of greed one can't help one's thoughts says the old warrior and this last really voices the secret excuse of all five and you all say to me my brain is myself how can i alter myself i was born like that in the first place you were not born like that you have lapsed to that and in the second place your brain is not yourself it is only a part of yourself and not the highest seat of authority do you love your mother wife or children with your brain do you desire with your brain do you in a word ultimately and essentially live with your brain no your brain is an instrument the proof that it is an instrument lies in the fact that when extreme necessity urges you can command your brain to do certain things and it does them the first of the two great principles which underlie the efficiency of the human machine is this the brain is a servant exterior to the central force of the ego if it is out of control the reason is not that it is uncontrollable but merely that its discipline has been neglected the brain can be trained as the hand and eye can be trained it can be made as obedient as a sporting dog and by similar methods in the meantime the indispensable preparation for brain discipline is to form the habit of regarding one's brain as an instrument exterior to one's self like a tongue or a foot End of chapter three Chapter four of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four The First Practical Step. The brain is a highly quaint organism. Let me say at once, lest I should be cannonaded by physiologists, psychologists, or metaphysicians, that by the brain i mean the faculty which reasons and which gives orders to the muscles i mean exactly what the plain man means by the brain the brain is the diplomatist which arranges relations between our instinctive self and the universe and it fulfils its mission when it provides for the maximum of freedom to the instincts with the minimum of friction it argues with the instincts it takes them on one side and points out the unwisdom of certain performances it catches them by the coat-tails when they are about to make fools of themselves don't drink all that ice champagne at a draught it says to one instinct we may die of it don't catch that rude fellow one in the eye it says to another instinct he is more powerful than us it is in fact a majestic spectacle of common sense and yet it has the most extraordinary lapses it is just like that man we all know him and consult him who is a continual fount of excellent sagacious advice on everything 
but who somehow cannot bring his sagacity to bear on his own personal career. In the matter of its own special activities, the brain is usually undisciplined and unreliable. We never know what it will do next. We give it some work to do, say, as we are walking along the street to the office, Perhaps it has to devise some scheme for making a hundred and fifty pounds suffice for two hundred pounds, or perhaps it has to plan out the heads of a very important letter. We meet a pretty woman, and away that undisciplined, sagacious brain runs after her, dropping the scheme or the draft letter, and amusing itself with aspirations or regrets for half an hour, an hour, sometimes a day. The serious part of our instinctive self feebly remonstrates, but without effect. Or it may be that we have suffered a great disappointment which is definite and hopeless. Will the brain, like a sensible creature, leave that disappointment alone, and instead of living in the past, live in the present or the future? Not it! Though it knows perfectly well that it is wasting its time, and casting a very painful and utterly unnecessary gloom over itself and us, it can so little control its unhealthy, morbid appetite that no expostulations will induce it to behave rationally. Or perhaps, after a confabulation with the soul, it has been decided that when next a certain harmful instinct comes into play, the brain shall firmly interfere. Yes, says the brain, I really will watch that. But when the moment arrives, is the brain on the spot? The brain has probably forgotten the affair entirely, or remembered it too late. Or sighs, as the victorious instinct knocks it on the head, well, next time. All this, and much more that every reader can supply from his own exciting souvenirs, is absurd and ridiculous on the part of the brain. It is a conclusive proof that the brain is out of condition, idle as a nigger, capricious as an actor-manager, and eaten to the core with loose habits. Therefore the brain must be put into training. It is the most important part of the human machine by which the soul expresses and develops itself, and it must learn good habits, and primarily it must be taught obedience. Obedience can only be taught by imposing one's will, by the sheer force of volition, and the brain must be mastered by willpower. The beginning of wise living lies in the control of the brain by the will, so that the brain may act according to the precepts which the brain itself gives. With an obedient, disciplined brain, a man may live always right up to the standard of his best moments. To teach a child obedience, you tell it to do something, and you see that that something is done the same with the brain. Here is the foundation of an efficient life and the antidote for the tendency to make a fool of oneself. It is marvellously simple. Say to your brain, from nine o'clock to nine-thirty this morning you must dwell without ceasing on a particular topic which I will give you. Now it doesn't matter what this topic is, the point is to control and invigorate the brain by exercise, but you may just as well give it a useful topic to think over as a futile one. You might give it this, my brain is my servant, I am not the plaything of my brain. Let it concentrate on these statements for thirty minutes. What? you cry. Is this the way to an efficient life? Why, there's nothing in it. Simple as it may appear, this is the way, and it is the only way. As for there being nothing in it, try it. I guarantee that you will fail to keep your brain concentrated on the given idea for thirty seconds, let alone thirty minutes. You will find your brain conducting itself in a manner which would be comic were it not tragic. 
your first experiments will result in disheartening failure for to exact from the brain at will and by will concentration on a given idea for even so short a period as half an hour is an exceedingly difficult feat and a fatiguing it needs perseverance it needs a terrible obstinacy on the part of the will that brain of yours will be hopping about all over the place and every time it hops you must bring it back by force to its original position you must absolutely compel it to ignore every idea except the one which you have selected for its attention you cannot hope to triumph all at once but you can hope to triumph there is no royal road to the control of the brain there is no patent dodge about it and no complicated function which a plain person may not comprehend it is simply a question of i will i will and i will italics here are indispensable let me resume efficient living living up to one's best standard getting the last ounce of power out of the machine with the minimum of friction these things depend on the disciplined and vigorous condition of the brain the brain can be disciplined by learning the habit of obedience and it can learn the habit of obedience by the practice of concentration disciplinary concentration though nothing could have the air of being simpler is the basis of the whole structure this fact must be grasped imaginatively it must be seen and felt the more regularly concentration is practised the more firmly will the imagination grasp the effects of it both direct and indirect after but a few days of honest trying in the exercise which i have indicated you will perceive its influence you will grow accustomed to the idea at first strange in its novelty of the brain being external to the supreme force which is you and in subjection to that force you will as a not very distant possibility see yourself in possession of the power to switch your brain on and off in a particular subject as you switch electricity on and off in a particular room the brain will get used to the straight paths of obedience and a remarkable phenomenon it will by the mere practice of obedience become less forgetful and more effective it will not so frequently give way to an instinct that takes it by surprise in a word it will have received a general tonic with a brain that is improving every day you can set about the perfecting of the machine in a scientific manner end of chapter four Chapter Five of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: Habit Forming by Concentration. As soon as the will has got the upper hand of the brain, as soon as it can say to the brain with a fair certainty of being obeyed, "Do this, think along these lines, and continue to do so without wandering until I give you leave to stop." then is the time arrived when the perfecting of the human machine may be undertaken in a large and comprehensive spirit as a city council undertakes the purification and reconstruction of a city the tremendous possibilities of an obedient brain will be perceived immediately we begin to reflect upon what we mean by our character now a person's character is and can be nothing else but the total result of his habits of thought a person is benevolent because he habitually thinks benevolently a person is idle because his thoughts dwell habitually on the instant pleasures of idleness it is true that everybody is born with certain predispositions and that these predispositions influence very strongly the early formation of habits of thought but the fact remains that the character is built by long-continued habits of thought 
if the mature edifice of character usually shows in an exaggerated form the peculiarities of the original predisposition this merely indicates a probability that the slow erection of the edifice has proceeded at haphazard and that reason has not presided over it a child may be born with a tendency to bent shoulders if nothing is done if on the contrary he becomes a clerk and abhors gymnastics his shoulders will develop an excessive roundness entirely through habit whereas if his will guided by his reason had compelled the formation of a corrective physical habit his shoulders might have been if not quite straight nearly so thus a physical habit the same with a mental habit the more closely we examine the development of original predispositions the more clearly we shall see that this development is not inevitable is not a process which works itself out independently according to mysterious ruthless laws which we cannot understand for instance the effect of an original predisposition may be destroyed by an accidental shock a young man with an inherited tendency to alcohol may develop into a stern teetotaler through the shock caused by seeing his drunken father strike his mother whereas if his father had chanced to be affectionate in drink the son might have ended in the gutter no ruthless law here it is notorious also that natures are sometimes completely changed in their development by chance momentary contact with natures stronger than themselves from that day i resolved etc you know the phrase often the resolve is not kept but often it is kept a spark has inflamed the will the burning will has tyrannized over the brain new habits have been formed and the result looks just like a miracle now if these great transformations can be brought about by accident cannot similar transformations be brought about by a reasonable design at any rate if one starts to bring them about one starts with the assurance that transformations are not impossible since they have occurred one starts also in the full knowledge of the influence of habit on life take any one of your own habits mental or physical you will be able to recall the time when that habit did not exist or if it did exist it was scarcely perceptible and you will discover that nearly all your habits have been formed unconsciously by daily repetitions which bore no relation to a general plan and which you practised not noticing you will be compelled to admit that your character as it is to-day is a structure that has been built almost without the aid of an architect higgledy-piggledy anyhow but occasionally the architect did step in and design something here and there among your habits you will find one that you consciously and of deliberate purpose initiated and persevered with doubtless owing to some happy influence what is the difference between that conscious habit and the unconscious habits none whatever as regards its effect on the sum of your character it may be the strongest of all your habits the only quality that differentiates it from the others is that it has a definite object most likely a good object and that it wholly or partially fulfils that object there is not a man who reads these lines but has in this detail or that proved in himself that the will forcing the brain to repeat the same action again and again can modify the shape of his character as a sculptor modifies the shape of damp clay but if a grown man's character is developing from day to day as it is if nine-tenths of the development is due to unconscious action and one-tenth to conscious action and if the one-tenth conscious is the most satisfactory part of the total result why in the name of common sense henceforward should not nine-tenths instead of one-tenth be due to conscious action what is there to prevent this agreeable consummation there is nothing whatever to prevent it except insubordination on the part of the brain 
and insubordination of the brain can be cured as i have previously shown when i see men unhappy and inefficient in the craft of living from sheer crass inattention to their own development when i see misshapen men building up businesses and empires and never stopping to build up themselves when i see dreary men expending precisely the same energy on teaching a dog to walk on its hind legs as would brighten the whole colour of their own lives i feel as if i wanted to give up the ghost so ridiculous so fatuous does the spectacle seem but of course i do not give up the ghost the paroxysm passes only i really must cry out can't you see what you're missing can't you see that you're missing the most interesting thing on earth far more interesting than businesses empires and dogs doesn't it strike you how clumsy and short-sighted you are working always with an inferior machine when you might have a smooth gliding perfection doesn't it strike you how badly you are treating yourself listen you confirmed grumbler you who make the evening meal hideous with complaints against destiny for it is you i will single out are you aware what people are saying about you behind your back they are saying that you render yourself and your family miserable by the habit which has grown on you of always grumbling surely it isn't as bad as that you protest yes it is just as bad as that you say the fact is i know it's absurd to grumble but i'm like that i've tried to stop it and i can't how have you tried to stop it well i've made up my mind several times to fight against it but i never succeed this is strictly between ourselves i don't usually admit that i'm a grumbler considering that you grumble for about an hour and a half every day of your life it was sanguine my dear sir to expect to cure such a habit by means of a solitary intention formed at intervals in the brain and then forgotten no you must do more than that if you will daily fix your brain firmly for half an hour on the truth you know it to be a truth that grumbling is absurd and futile your brain will henceforward begin to form a habit in that direction it will begin to be moulded to the idea that grumbling is absurd and futile in odd moments when it isn't thinking of anything in particular it will suddenly remember that grumbling is absurd and futile when you sit down to the meal and open your mouth to say i can't think what my ass of a partner means by it will remember that grumbling is absurd and futile and will alter the arrangement of your throat teeth and tongue so that you will say what fine weather we're having in brief it will remember involuntarily by a new habit all who look into their experience will admit that the failure to replace old habits by new ones is due to the fact that at the critical moment the brain does not remember it simply forgets the practice of concentration will cure that all depends on regular concentration this grumbling is an instance though chosen not quite at hazard End of chapter 5、Chapter、Six Lord Over the Noddle Having proved by personal experiment the truth of the first of the two great principles which concern the human machine, namely that the brain is a servant not a master and can be controlled we may now come to the second the second is more fundamental than the first but it can be of no use until the first is understood and put into practice the human machine is an apparatus of brain and muscle for enabling the ego to develop freely in the universe by which it is surrounded without friction 
its function is to convert the facts of the universe to the best advantage of the ego the facts of the universe are the material with which it is its business to deal not the facts of an ideal universe but the facts of this universe hence when friction occurs when the facts of the universe cease to be of advantage to the ego the fault is in the machine it is not the solar system that has gone wrong but the human machine second great principle therefore in case of friction the machine is always at fault you can control nothing but your own mind even your two-year-old babe may defy you by the instinctive force of its personality but your own mind you can control your own mind is a sacred enclosure into which nothing harmful can enter except by your permission your own mind has the power to transmute every external phenomenon to its own purposes if happiness arises from cheerfulness kindliness and rectitude and who will deny it what possible combination of circumstances is going to make you unhappy so long as the machine remains in order if self-development consists in the utilization of one's environment not utilization of somebody else's environment how can your environment prevent you from developing you would look rather foolish without it anyway in that noddle of yours is everything necessary for development for the maintaining of dignity for the achieving of happiness and you are absolute lord over the noddle will you but exercise the powers of lordship why worry about the contents of somebody else's noddle in which you can be nothing but an intruder when you may arrive at a better result with absolute certainty by confining your activities to your own look within the kingdom of heaven is within you oh yes you protest all that's old epictetus said that marcus aurelius said that christ said that they did i admit it readily but if you were ruffled this morning because your motor omnibus broke down and you had to take a cab then so far as you are concerned these great teachers lived in vain you calling yourself a reasonable man are going about dependent for your happiness dignity and growth upon a thousand things over which you have no control and the most exquisitely organized machine for ensuring happiness dignity and growth is rusting away inside you and all because you have a sort of notion that a saying said two thousand years ago cannot be practical you remark sagely to your child no my child you cannot have that moon and you will accomplish nothing by crying for it now here is this beautiful box of bricks by means of which you may amuse yourself while learning many wonderful matters and improving your mind you must try to be content with what you have and to make the best of it if you had the moon you wouldn't be any happier then you lie awake half the night repining because the last post has brought a letter to the effect that the board cannot entertain your application for etc you say the two cases are not alike they are not your child has never heard of epictetus on the other hand justice is the moon at your age you surely know that but the directors ought to have granted my application you insist exactly i agree but we're not in a universe of oughts you have a special apparatus within you for dealing with a universe where oughts are flagrantly disregarded and you are not using it you are lying awake keeping your wife awake injuring your health injuring hers losing your dignity and your cheerfulness why because you think that these antics and performances will influence the board because you think that they will put you into a better condition for dealing with your environment tomorrow not a bit simply because the machine is at fault in certain cases we do make use of our machines as well as their sad condition of neglect will allow 
but in other cases we behave in an extraordinarily irrational manner. Thus, if we sally out and get caught in a heavy shower, we do not, unless very far gone in foolishness, sit down and curse the weather. We put up our umbrella, if we have one, and if not, we hurry home. We may grumble, but it is not serious grumbling. We accept the shower as a fact of the universe and control ourselves. Thus, also, if by a sudden catastrophe we lose somebody who is important to us, we grieve, but we control ourselves, recognising one of those hazards of destiny from which not even millionaires are exempt. And the result on our ego is usually to improve it in essential respects. But there are other strokes of destiny, other facts of the universe, against which we protest as a child protests when deprived of the moon. Take the case of an individual with an imperfect idea of honesty. Now, that individual is the consequence of his father and mother and his environment, and his father and mother of theirs, and so backwards to the single-celled protoplasm. That individual is a result of the cosmic order, the inevitable product of cause and effect. We know that. We must admit that he is just as much a fact of the universe as a shower of rain or a storm at sea that swallows a ship. We freely grant in the abstract that there must be, at the present stage of evolution, a certain number of persons with unfair minds. We are quite ready to contemplate such an individual with philosophy until it happens that, in the course of the progress of the solar system, he runs up against ourselves. Then listen to the outcry. Listen to the continual explosions of a righteous man aggrieved. The individual may be our clerk, cashier, son, father, brother, partner, wife, employer, we are ill-used, we are being treated unfairly, we kick, we scream, we nourish the inward sense of grievance that eats the core out of content. We sit down in the rain, we decline to think of umbrellas or to run to shelter. We care not that that individual is a fact which the universe has been slowly manufacturing for millions of years. Our attitude implies that we want eternity to roll back and begin again in such wise that we, at any rate, shall not be disturbed. Though we have a machine for the transmutation of facts into food for our growth, we do not dream of using it. But, we say, he is doing us harm. Where? In our minds. He has robbed us of our peace, our comfort, our happiness, our good temper. Even if he has, we might just as well inveigh against a shower. But has he? What was our brain doing while this naughty person stepped in and robbed us of the only possessions worth having? No, no. It is not that he has done us harm. The one cheerful item in a universe of stony facts is that no one can harm anybody except himself. It is merely that we have been silly, precisely as silly as if we had taken a seat in the rain with a folded umbrella by our side. The machine is at fault. I fancy we are now obtaining glimpses of what that phrase really means. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Human Machine by Arnold Bennett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 What Living Chiefly Is it is in intercourse, social, sentimental, or business, with one's fellows, that the qualities and the condition of the human machine are put to the test and strained. That part of my life which I conduct by myself, without reference, or at any rate without direct reference, to others, I can usually manage in such a way that the gods do not positively weep at the spectacle thereof, 
my environment is simpler, less puzzling, when I am alone, my calm and my self-control less liable to violent fluctuations, impossible to be disturbed by a chair, impossible that a chair should get on one's nerves, impossible to blame a chair for not being as reasonable, as archangelic as I am myself. But when it comes to people, well, that is living then. The art of life, the art of extracting all its power from the human machine, does not lie chiefly in processes of bookish culture, nor in contemplations of the beauty and majesty of existence. It lies chiefly in keeping the peace, the whole peace, and nothing but the peace, with those with whom one is thrown. Is it in sitting ecstatic over Shelley, Shakespeare, or Herbert Spencer, solitary in my room of a night, that I am improving myself and learning to live? Or is it in watching over all my daily human contacts? Do not seek to escape the comparison by insinuating that I despise study, or by pointing out that the eternal verities are beyond dailiness. Nothing of the kind. I am so silly about books that merely to possess them gives me pleasure. And if the verities are good for eternity, they ought to be good for a day. If I cannot exchange them for daily coin, if I can't buy happiness for a single day because I've nothing less than an eternal verity about me and nobody has sufficient change, then my eternal verity is not an eternal verity. It is merely an unnegotiable bit of glass called a diamond, or even a note on the bank of engraving. I can say to myself when I arise in the morning, I am master of my brain. No one can get in there and rage about like a bull in a china shop. If my companions on the planet's crust choose to rage about, they cannot affect me. I will not let them. I have power to maintain my own calm, and I will. No earthly being can force me to be false to my principles, or to be blind to the beauty of the universe, or to be gloomy, or to be irritable or to complain against my lot. For these things depend on the brain. Cheerfulness, kindliness, and honest thinking are all within the department of the brain. The disciplined brain can accomplish them, and my brain is disciplined, and I will discipline it more and more as the days pass. I am, therefore, independent of hazard, and I will back myself to conduct all intercourse as becomes a rational creature. I can say this. I can ram this argument by force of will into my brain, and by dint of repeating it often enough, I shall assuredly arrive at the supreme virtues of reason. I should assuredly conquer, the brain being such a machine of habit, even if I did not take the trouble to consider in the slightest degree what manner of things my fellow-men are, by acting merely in my own interests. But the way of perfection, I speak relatively, will be immensely shortened and smoothed if I do consider dispassionately the case of the other human machines. Thus, the truth is that my attitude towards my fellows is fundamentally and totally wrong, and that it entails on my thinking machine a strain which is quite unnecessary, though I may have arranged the machine so as to withstand the strain successfully. The secret of smooth living is a calm cheerfulness which will leave me always in full possession of my reasoning faculty in order that I may live by reason instead of by instinct and momentary passion. The secret of calm cheerfulness is kindliness. No person can be consistently cheerful and calm who does not consistently think kind thoughts. But how can I be kindly when I pass the major portion of my time in blaming the people who surround me? who are part of my environment. If I, 
blaming achieve some approach to kindliness it is only by a great and exhausting effort of self-mastery the inmost secret then lies in not blaming in not judging and emitting verdicts oh i do not blame by word of mouth i am far too advanced for such a puerility i keep the blame in my own breast where it festers i am always privately forgiving which is bad for me because you know there is nothing to forgive i do not have to forgive bad weather nor if i found myself in an earthquake should i have to forgive the earthquake all blame uttered or unexpressed is wrong i do not blame myself i can explain myself to myself i can invariably explain myself if i forged a friend's name on a cheque i should explain the affair quite satisfactorily to myself and instead of blaming myself i should sympathise with myself for having been driven into such an excessively awkward corner let me examine honestly my mental processes and i must admit that my attitude towards others is entirely different from my attitude towards myself i must admit that in the seclusion of my mind though i say not a word i am constantly blaming others because i am not happy whenever i bump up against an opposing personality and my smooth progress is impeded i secretly blame the opposer i act as though i had shouted to the world clear out of the way everyone for i am coming everyone does not clear out of the way i did not really expect everyone to clear out of the way but i act within as though i had so expected i blame hence kindliness hence cheerfulness is rendered vastly more difficult for me what i ought to do is this i ought to reflect again and again and yet again that the beings among whom i have to steer the living environment out of which i have to manufacture my happiness are just as inevitable in the scheme of evolution as i am myself have just as much right to be themselves as i have to be myself are precisely my equals in the face of nature are capable of being explained as i am capable of being explained are entitled to the same latitude as i am entitled to and are no more responsible for their composition and their environment than i for mine i ought to reflect again and again and yet again that they all deserve from me as much sympathy as i give to myself why not having thus reflected in a general manner i ought to take one by one the individuals with whom i am brought into frequent contact and seek by a deliberate effort of the imagination and the reason to understand them to understand why they act thus and thus what their difficulties are what their explanation is and how friction can be avoided so i ought to reflect morning after morning until my brain is saturated with the cases of these individuals here is a course of discipline if i follow it i shall gradually lose the preposterous habit of blaming and i shall have laid the foundations of that quiet unshakable self-possession which is the indispensable preliminary of conduct according to reason of thorough efficiency in the machine of happiness but something in me something distinctly base says yes the put yourself in his place business over again the do unto others business over again just so something in me is ashamed of being moral you all know the feeling well morals are naught but another name for reasonable conduct a higher and more practical form of egotism an egotism which while freeing others frees myself i have tried the lower form of egotism 
and it has failed if i am afraid of being moral if i prefer to cut off my nose to spite my face well i must accept the consequences but truth will prevail End of chapter 7chapter 8 of the human machine by arnold bennett this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 8 the daily friction it is with common daily affairs that i am now dealing not with heroic enterprises ambitions martyrdoms take the day the ordinary day in the ordinary house or office though it comes seven times a week and is the most banal thing imaginable it is quite worth attention how does the machine get through it ah the best that can be said of the machine is that it does get through it somehow the friction though seldom such as to bring matters to a standstill is frequent the sort of friction that when it occurs in a bicycle is just sufficient to annoy the rider but not sufficient to make him get off the machine and examine the bearings occasionally the friction is very loud indeed disturbing and at rarer intervals it shrieks like an omnibus break out of order you know those days when you have the sensation that life is not large enough to contain the household or the office staff when the business of intercourse may be compared to the manoeuvres of two people who having awakened with a bad headache are obliged to dress simultaneously in a very small bedroom after you with that towel in accents of bitter grinding politeness if you could kindly move your things off this chair in a voice that would blow brains out if it were a bullet i venture to say that you know those days but you reply such days are few usually well usually the friction though less intense is still proceeding we grow accustomed to it we scarcely notice it as a person in a stuffy chamber will scarcely notice the stuffiness but the deteriorating influence due to friction goes on even if unperceived and one morning we perceive its ravages and write a letter to the telegraph to inquire whether life is worth living or whether marriage is a failure or whether men are more polite than women the proof that friction in various and varying degrees is practically conscious in most households lies in the fact that when we chance on a household where there is no friction we are startled we can't recover from the phenomenon and in describing this household to our friends we say they get on so well together as if we were saying they have wings and can fly just fancy did you ever hear of such a thing ninety per cent of all daily friction is caused by tone mere tone of voice try this experiment say oh you little darling you sweet pet you entirely charming creature to a baby or a dog but roar these delightful epithets in the tone of saying you infernal little nuisance if i hear another sound i'll break every bone in your body the baby will infallibly whimper and the dog will infallibly mooch off true a dog is not a human being neither is a baby they cannot understand it is precisely because they cannot understand and articulate words that the experiment is valuable for it separates the effect of the tone from the effect of the word spoken he who speaks speaks twice his words convey his thought and his tone conveys his mental attitude towards the person spoken to and certainly the attitude so far as friction goes is more important than the thought your wife may say to you i shall buy that hat i spoke to you about and you may reply quite sincerely as you please 
but it will depend on your tone whether you convey as you please i am sympathetically anxious that your innocent caprices should be indulged or whether you convey as you please only don't bother me with hats i am above hats a great deal too much money is spent in this house on hats however i am helpless or whether you convey as you please heart of my heart but if you would like to be a nice girl go gently we're rather tight i need not elaborate i am sure of being comprehended as tone is the expression of attitude it is of course caused by attitude the frictional tone is chiefly due to that general attitude of blame which i have already condemned as being absurd and unjustifiable as by constant watchful discipline we gradually lose this silly attitude of blame so the tone will of itself gradually change but the two ameliorations can proceed together and it is a curious thing that an agreeable tone artificially and deliberately adopted will influence the mental attitude almost as much as the mental attitude will influence the tone if you honestly feel resentful against someone but having understood the foolishness of fury intentionally mask your fury under a persuasive tone your fury will at once begin to abate you will be led into a rational train of thought you will see that after all the object of your resentment has a right to exist and that he is neither a doormat nor a scoundrel and that anyhow nothing is to be gained and much is to be lost by fury you will see that fury is unworthy of you do you remember the gentleness of the tone which you employed after the healing of your first quarrel with a beloved companion do you remember the persuasive tone which you used when you wanted to obtain something from a difficult person on whom your happiness depended why should not your tone always combine these qualities why should you not carefully school your tone is it beneath you to ensure the largest possible amount of your own way by the simplest means or is there at the back of your mind that peculiarly english and german idea that politeness sympathy and respect for another immortal soul would imply deplorable weakness on your part you say that your happiness does not depend on every person whom you happen to speak to yes it does your happiness is always dependent on just that person produce friction and you suffer idle to argue that the person has no business to be upset by your tone you have caused avoidable friction simply because your machine for dealing with your environment was suffering from pride ignorance or thoughtlessness you say i am making a mountain out of a molehill no i am making a mountain out of ten million molehills and that is what life does it is the little but continuous causes that have great effects i repeat why not deliberately adopt a gentle persuasive tone just to see what the results are surely you are not ashamed to be wise you may smile superiorly as you read this yet you know very well that more than once you have resolved to use a gentle and persuasive tone on all occasions and that the sole reason why you had that fearful shindy yesterday with your cousin's sister-in-law was that you had long since failed to keep your resolve but you were of my mind once and more than once what you have to do is to teach the new habit to your brain by daily concentration on it by forcing your brain to think of nothing else for half an hour of a morning after a time the brain will begin to remember automatically for of course the explanation of your previous failures is that your brain undisciplined merely forgot at the critical moment the tone was out of your mouth 
before your brain had waked up. It is necessary to watch as though you were a sentinel not only against the wrong tone, but against the other symptoms of the attitude of blame, such as the frown. It is necessary to regard yourself constantly and in minute detail. You lie in bed for half an hour and enthusiastically concentrate on this beautiful new scheme of the right tone. You rise, and because you don't achieve a proper elegance of necktie at the first knotting, you frown and swear and clench your teeth. There is a symptom of the wrong attitude towards your environment. You are awake, but your brain isn't. It is in such a symptom that you may judge yourself. And not a trifling symptom either, if you will frown at a necktie, if you will use language to a necktie which no gentleman should use to a necktie, what will you be capable of to a responsible being? Yes, it is very difficult, but it can be done. End of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Fire. In this business of daily living, of ordinary usage of the machine in hourly intercourse, there occurs sometimes a phenomenon which is the cause of a great deal of trouble, and the result of a very ill tended machine. It is a phenomenon impossible to ignore and yet so shameful is it so degrading so shocking so miserable that i hesitate to mention it for one class of reader is certain to ridicule me loftily saying one really doesn't expect to find this sort of thing in print nowadays and another class of reader is certain to get angry nevertheless as one of my main objects in the present book is to discuss matters which people don't talk about, I shall discuss this matter. But my diffidence in doing so is such that I must approach it deviously, describing it first by means of a figure. Imagine that, looking at a man's house, you suddenly perceive it to be on fire. The flame is scarcely perceptible. You could put it out if you had a free hand. But you have not got a free hand. It is his house, not yours. He may or may not know that his house is burning. You are aware by experience, however, that if you directed his attention to the flame, the effect of your warning would be exceedingly singular, almost incredible. For the effect would be that he would instantly begin to strike matches, pour on petroleum and fan the flame violently resenting interference therefore you can only stand and watch hoping that he will notice the flames before they are beyond control and extinguish them the probability is however that he will notice the flames too late and powerless to avert disaster you are condemned therefore to watch the damage of valuable property the flames leap higher and higher, and they do not die down till they have burned themselves out. You avert your gaze from the spectacle, and until you are gone, the owner of the house pretends that nothing has occurred. When alone, he curses himself for his carelessness. The foregoing is meant to be a description of what happens when a man passes through the incendiary experience known as losing his temper. There, the cat of my chapter is out of the bag. A man who has lost his temper is simply being burnt out. His constitutes one of the most curious and, for everybody, humiliating spectacles that life offers. It is an insurrection, a boiling over, a sweeping storm, Dignity, common sense, justice are shriveled up and destroyed. Anarchy reigns. The devil has broken his chain. Instinct is stamping on the face of reason. And in that man, civilization has temporarily receded millions of years. 
of course the thing amounts to a nervous disease and i think it is almost universal you at once protest that you never lose your temper haven't lost your temper for ages but do you not mean that you have not smashed furniture for ages these fires are of varying intensities some of them burn very dully yet they burn one man loses his temper another is merely ruffled but the event is the same in kind when you are ruffled when you are conscious of a resentful vibration that surprises all your being when your voice changes when you notice a change in the demeanour of your companion who sees that he has touched a tender point you may not go to the length of smashing furniture but you have had a fire and your dignity is damaged you admit it to yourself afterwards i am sure you know what i mean and i am nearly sure that you with your courageous candour will admit that from time to time you suffer from these mysterious fires temper one of the plagues of human society is generally held to be incurable save by the vague process of exercising self-control a process which seldom has any beneficial results it is regarded now as smallpox used to be regarded as a visitation of providence which must be borne but i do not hold it to be incurable i am convinced that it is permanently curable and its eminent importance as a nuisance to mankind at large deserves i think that it should receive particular attention anyhow i am strongly against the visitation of providence theory as being unscientific primitive and conducive to unashamed laissez aller a man can be master in his own house if he cannot be master by simple force of will he can be master by ruse and wile i would employ cleverness to maintain the throne of reason when it is likely to be upset in the mind by one of these devastating and disgraceful insurrections of brute instinct it is useless for a man in the habit of losing or mislaying his temper to argue with himself that such a proceeding is folly that it serves no end and does nothing but harm it is useless for him to argue that in allowing his temper to stray he is probably guilty of cruelty and certainly guilty of injustice to those persons who are forced to witness the loss it is useless for him to argue that a man of uncertain temper in a house is like a man who goes about a house with a loaded revolver sticking from his pocket and that all considerations of fairness and reason have to be subordinated in that house to the fear of the revolver and that such peace as is maintained in that house is often a shameful and an unjust peace these arguments will not be strong enough to prevail against one of the most powerful and capricious of all habits this habit must be met and conquered and it can be by an even more powerful quality in the human mind i mean the universal human horror of looking ridiculous the man who loses his temper often thinks he is doing something rather fine and majestic on the contrary so far is this from being the fact he is merely making an ass of himself he is merely parading himself as an undignified fool as that supremely contemptible figure a grown-up baby he may intimidate a feeble companion by his raging or by the dark sullenness of a more subdued flame but in the heart of even the weakest companion is a bedrock feeling of contempt for him the way in which a man of uncertain temper is treated by his friends proves that they despise him for they do not treat him as a reasonable being how should they treat him as a reasonable being when the tenure of his reason is so insecure and if only he could hear what is said of him behind his back the invalid can cure himself by teaching his brain the habit of dwelling upon his extreme fatuity let him concentrate regularly with intense fixation upon the ideas 
when I lose my temper, when I get ruffled, when that mysterious vibration runs through me, I am making a donkey of myself, a donkey and a donkey. You understand? A preposterous donkey. I'm behaving like a great baby. I look a fool. I am a spectacle bereft of dignity. Everybody despises me, smiles at me in secret, disdains the idiotic ass with whom it is impossible to reason. Ordinarily, the invalid disguises from himself this aspect of his disease, and his brain will instinctively avoid it as much as it can. But in hours of calm, he can slowly and regularly force his brain, by the practice of concentration, to familiarise itself with just this aspect, so that in time its instinct will be to think first and not last of just this aspect. When he has arrived at that point, he is saved. No man who, at the very inception of the fire, is visited with a clear vision of himself as an arrant ass and pitiable object of contempt will lack the volition to put the fire out. But, be it noted, he will not succeed until he can do it at once. A fire is a fire, and the engines must gallop by themselves out of the station instantly. This means the acquirement of a mental habit. During the preliminary stages of the cure he should, of course, avoid inflammable situations. This is a perfectly simple thing to do if the brain has been disciplined out of its natural forgetfulness. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten Mischievously Overworking It. I have dealt with the two general major causes of friction in the daily use of the machine. I will now deal with a minor cause and make an end of mere dailiness. This minor cause and after all i do not know that its results are so trifling as to justify the epithet minor is the straining of the machine by forcing it to do work which it was never intended to do although we are incapable of persuading our machines to do effectively that which they are bound to do somehow we continually overburden them with entirely unnecessary and inept tasks we cannot, it would seem, let things alone. For example, in the ordinary household, the amount of machine horsepower expended in fighting for the truth is really quite absurd. This pure zeal for the establishment and general admission of the truth is usually termed contradictoriness, but of course it is not that, it is something higher. My wife states that the Joneses have gone into a new flat, of which the rent is £165 a year. Now, Jones has told me personally that the rent of his new flat is £156 a year. I correct my wife. Knowing that she is in the right, she corrects me. She cannot bear that a falsehood should prevail. It is not a question of £9. It is a question of truth. Her enthusiasm for truth excites my enthusiasm for truth. Five minutes ago I didn't care tuppence whether the rent of the Joneses' new flat was 165 or 156 or 1,056 pounds a year. But now I care intensely that it is 156 pounds. I have formed myself into a select society for the propagating of the truth about the rent of the Joneses' new flat, and my wife has done the same in eloquence, in argumentative skill, in strict supervision of our tempers, we each of us squander enormous quantities of that HP which is so precious to us, and the net effect is naught. Now, if one of us two had understood the elementary principles of human engineering, that one would have said privately, truth is indestructible, truth will out, Truth is never in a hurry. 
if it doesn't come out today it will come out tomorrow or next year it can take care of itself ultimately my wife or my husband will learn the essential cosmic truth about the rent of the joneses new flat i already know it and the moment when she or he knows it also will be the moment of my triumph she or he will not celebrate my triumph openly but it will be none the less real and my reputation for accuracy and calm restraint will be consolidated if by a rare mischance i am in error it will be vastly better for me in the day of my undoing that i have not been too positive now besides nobody has appointed me sole custodian of the great truth concerning the rent of the jones's new flat i was not brought into the world to be a safe deposit and more urgent matters summon me to effort if one of us had meditated thus much needless friction would have been avoided and power saved amour propre would not have been exposed to risks the sacred cause of truth would not in the least have suffered and the rent of the jones's new flat would anyhow have remained exactly what it is in addition to straining the machine by our excessive anxiety for the spread of truth we give a very great deal too much attention to the state of other people's machines i cannot too strongly too sarcastically deprecate this astonishing habit it will be found to be rife in nearly every household and in nearly every office we are most of us endeavouring to rearrange the mechanism in other heads than our own this is always dangerous and generally futile considering the difficulty we have in our own brains where our efforts are sure of being accepted as well meant and where we have at any rate a rough notion of the machine's construction our intrepidity in adventuring among the delicate adjustments of other brains is remarkable we are cursed by too much of the missionary spirit we must needs voyage into the china of our brother's brain and explain there that things are seriously wrong in that heathen land and make ourselves unpleasant in the hope of getting them put right we have all our own brain and body on which to wreak our personality but this is not enough we must extend our personality further just as though we were a colonizing world power intoxicated by the idea of the white man's burden one of the central secrets of efficient daily living is to leave our daily companions alone a great deal more than we do and attend to ourselves if a daily companion is conducting his life upon principles which you know to be false and with results which you feel to be unpleasant the safe rule is to keep your mouth shut or if out of your singular conceit you are compelled to open it open it with all precautions and with the formal politeness you would use to a stranger intimacy is no excuse for rough manners though the majority of us seem to think it is you are not in charge of the universe you are in charge of yourself you cannot hope to manage the universe in your spare time and if you try you will probably make a mess of such part of the universe as you touch while gravely neglecting yourself in every family there is generally someone whose meddlesome interest in other machines leads to serious friction in his own criticize less even in the secrecy of your chamber and do not blame at all accept your environment and adapt yourself to it in silence instead of noisily attempting to adapt your environment to yourself here is true wisdom you have no business trespassing beyond the confines of your own individuality in so trespassing you are guilty of impertinence this is obvious and yet one of the chief activities of home life consists in prancing about at random on other people's private lawns what i say applies even to the relation between parents and children and though my precept is exaggerated it is purposely exaggerated in order effectively to balance the exaggeration in the opposite direction 
all individualities other than one's own are part of one's environment. The evolutionary process is going on all right, and they are a portion of it. Treat them as inevitable. To assert that they are inevitable is not to assert that they are unalterable. Only the alteration of them is not primarily your affair. It is theirs. Your affair is to use them as they are, without self-righteousness, blame or complaint, for the smooth furtherance of your own ends. There is no intention here to rob them of responsibility by depriving them of free will while saddling you with responsibility as a free agent. As your environment, they must be accepted as inevitable because they are inevitable. But as centres themselves, they have their own responsibility, which is not yours. The historic question, have we free will or are we the puppets of determinism, enters now. As a question, it is fascinating and futile. It has never been and it never will be settled. The theory of determinism cannot be demolished by argument. But in his heart, every man, including the most obstinate supporter of the theory, demolishes it every hour of every day. On the other hand, the theory of free will can be demolished by ratiocination so much the worse for ratiocination. If we regard ourselves as free agents and the personalities surrounding us as the puppets of determinism, we shall have arrived at the working compromise from which the finest results of living can be obtained. The philosophic experience of centuries, if it has proved anything, has proved this. And the man who acts upon it in the common, banal contracts and collisions of the difficult experiment which we call daily life will speedily become convinced of its practical worth. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Human Machine by Arnold Bennett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 an interlude. For ten chapters you have stood it, but not without protest. I know the feeling which is in your minds, and which has manifested itself in numerous criticisms of my ideas. That feeling may be briefly translated, perhaps, thus. This is all very well, but it isn't true, not a bit. It's only a fairy tale that you have been telling us. Miracles don't happen, etc. I, on my part, have a feeling that unless I take your feeling in hand at once and firmly deal with it, I had better put my shutters up, for you will have got into the way of regarding me simply as a source of idle amusement. Already I can perceive, from the expressions of some critics, that, so far as they are concerned, I might just as well not have written a word. Therefore, at this point, I pause, in order to insist once more upon what I began by saying. The burden of your criticism is, human nature is always the same. I know my faults, but it is useless to tell me about them. I can't alter them. I was born like that. The fatal weakness of this argument is, first, that it is based on a complete falsity, and, second, that it puts you in an untenable position. Human nature does change. Nothing can be more unscientific, more hopelessly medieval, than to imagine that it does not. It changes like everything else. You can't see it change, true. But then you can't see the grass growing, not unless you arise very early. Is human nature the same now as in the days of Babylonian civilization, when the social machine was oiled by drenchings of blood? Is it the same now as in the days of Greek civilization, when there was no such thing as romantic love between the sexes? Is it the same now as it was during the centuries when constant friction had to provide its own cure in the shape of constant war? Is it the same now as it was on the 2nd of March, 1819, when the British government officially opposed a motion to consider the severity of the criminal laws, 
which included capital punishment for cutting down a tree and other sensible dodges against friction, and were defeated by a majority of only nineteen votes. Is it the same now as in the year 1883, when the first SPCC was formed in England? If you consider that human nature is still the same, you should instantly go out and make a bonfire of the works of Spencer, Darwin and Wallace, and then return to enjoy the purely jocular side of the present volume. If you admit that it has changed, let me ask you how it has changed, unless by the continual infinitesimal efforts upon themselves of individual men like you and me. Did you suppose it was changed by magic, or by acts of parliament, or by the action of groups on persons, and not of persons on groups? Let me tell you that human nature has changed since yesterday. Let me tell you that today reason has a more powerful voice in the directing of instinct than it had yesterday. Let me tell you that today the friction of the machines is less screechy and grinding than it was yesterday. You were born like that, and you can't alter yourself, and so it's no use talking. If you really believe this, why make any effort at all? Why not let the whole business beautifully slide and yield to your instincts? What object can there be in trying to control yourself in any manner whatever if you are unalterable? Assert yourself to be unalterable, and you assert yourself a fatalist. Assert yourself a fatalist, and you free yourself from all moral responsibility, and other people too. Well then, act up to your convictions, if convictions they are. If you can't alter yourself, I can't alter myself. And supposing that I come along and bash you on the head and steal your purse, you can't blame me. You can only, on recovering consciousness, affectionately grasp my hand and murmur, Don't apologise, my dear fellow. We can't alter ourselves. This, you say, is absurd. It is. That is one of my innumerable points. The truth is, you do not really believe that you cannot alter yourself. What is the matter with you is just what is the matter with me, sheer idleness. You hate getting up in the morning, and to excuse your inexcusable indolence, you talk big about fate. Just as patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, so fatalism is the last refuge of a shirker. But you deceive no one, least of all yourself. You have not, rationally, a leg to stand on. At this juncture, because I have made you laugh, you consent to say, I do try all I can, but I can only alter myself a very little. By constitution, I am mentally idle. I can't help that, can I? Well, so long as you are not the only absolutely unchangeable thing in a universe of change, I don't mind. It is something for you to admit that you can alter yourself even a very little. The difference between our philosophies is now only a question of degree. In the application of any system of perfecting the machine, no two persons will succeed equally. From the disappointed tone of some of your criticisms, it might be fancied that I had advertised a system for making archangels out of tailor's dummies. Such was not my hope. I have no belief in miracles. But I know that when a thing is thoroughly well done, it often has the air of being a miracle. My sole aim is to insist that every man shall perfect his machine to the best of his powers, not to the best of somebody else's powers. I do not indulge in any hope that a man can be better than his best self. I am, however, convinced that every man fails to be his best self a great deal oftener than he need fail, for the reason that his will-power, be it great or small, is not directed according to the principles of common sense. Common sense will surely lead a man to ask the question, why did my actions yesterday contradict my reason? 
the reply to this question will nearly always be because at the critical moment i forgot the supreme explanation of the abortive results of so many efforts at self-alteration the supreme explanation of our frequent miserable scurrying into a doctrine of fatalism is simple forgetfulness it is not force that we lack but the skill to remember exactly what our reason would have us do or think at the moment itself how is this skill to be acquired it can only be acquired as skill at games is acquired by practice by the training of the organ involved to such a point that the organ acts rightly by instinct instead of wrongly by instinct there are degrees of success in this procedure but there is no such phenomenon as complete failure habits which increase friction can be replaced by habits which lessen friction habits which arrest development can be replaced by habits which encourage development and as a habit is formed naturally so it can be formed artificially by imitation of the unconscious process by accustoming the brain to the new idea let me as an example refer again to the minor subject of daily friction and within that subject to the influence of tone a man employs a frictional tone through habit the frictional tone is an instinct with him but if he had a quarter of an hour to reflect before speaking and if during that quarter of an hour he could always listen to arguments against the frictional tone his use of the frictional tone would rapidly diminish his reason would conquer his instinct as things are his instinct conquers his reason by a surprise attack by taking it unawares regular daily concentration of the brain for a certain period upon the non-frictional tone and the immense advantages of its use will gradually set up in the brain a new habit of thinking about the non-frictional tone until at length the brain disciplined turns to the correct act before the old silly instinct can capture it and ultimately a new sagacious instinct will supplant the old one this is the rationale it applies to all habits any person can test its efficiency in any habit i care not whether he be of strong or weak will he can test it he will soon see the tremendous difference between merely making a good resolution he has been doing that all his life without any very brilliant consequences and concentrating the brain for a given time exclusively upon a good resolution concentration the efficient mastery of the brain all is there end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: An Interest in Life. After a certain period of mental discipline, of deliberate habit forming and habit breaking, such as I have been indicating, a man will begin to acquire, at any rate, a superficial knowledge, a nodding acquaintance with that wonderful and mysterious affair his brain and he will also begin to perceive how important a factor in daily life is the control of his brain he will assuredly be surprised at the miracles which lie between his collar and his hat in that queer box that he calls his head for the effects that can be accomplished by mere steady persistent thinking must appear to be miracles to apprentices in the practice of thought when once a man having passed an unhappy day because his clumsy negligent brain forgot to control his instincts at a critical moment has said to his brain i will force you by concentrating you on that particular point to act efficiently the next time similar circumstances arise and when he has carried out his intention and when the awkward circumstances have recurred and his brain disciplined has done its work and so prevented unhappiness 
then that man will regard his brain with a new eye by jove he will say i've stopped one source of unhappiness anyway there was a time when i should have made a fool of myself in a little domestic crisis such as to-day's but i have gone safely through it i am all right she is all right the atmosphere is not dangerous with undischarged electricity and all because my brain being in proper condition watched firmly over my instincts i must keep this up he will peer into that brain more and more he will see more and more of its possibilities he will have a new and a supreme interest in life a garden is a fairly interesting thing but the cultivation of a garden is as dull as cold mutton compared to the cultivation of a brain and wet weather won't interfere with digging planting and pruning in the box in due season the man whose hobby is his brain will gradually settle down into a daily routine with which routine he will start to day the idea at the back of the mind of the ordinary man by the ordinary man i mean the man whose brain is not his hobby is almost always this there are several things at present hanging over me worries unfulfilled ambitions unrealized desires as soon as these things are definitely settled then i shall begin to live and enjoy myself that is the ordinary man's usual idea he has it from his youth to his old age he is invariably waiting for something to happen before he really begins to live i am sure that if you are an ordinary man of course you aren't i know you will admit that this is true of you you exist in the hope that one day things will be sufficiently smoothed out for you to begin to live that is just where you differ from the man whose brain is his hobby his daily routine consists in a meditation in the following vein this day is before me the circumstances of this day are my environment they are the material out of which by means of my brain i have to live and be happy and to refrain from causing unhappiness in other people it is the business of my brain to make use of this material my brain is in its box for that sole purpose not to-morrow not next year not when i have made my fortune not when my sick child is out of danger not when my wife has returned to her senses not when my salary is raised not when i have passed that examination not when my indigestion is better but now to-day exactly as to-day is the facts of to-day which in my unregeneracy i regarded primarily as anxieties nuisances impediments i now regard as so much raw material from which my brain has to weave a tissue of life that is comely and then he foresees the day as well as he can his experiences teach him where he will have difficulty and he administers to his brain the lessons of which it will have most need he carefully looks the machine over and arranges it specially for the sort of road which he knows that it will have to traverse and especially he readjusts his point of view for his point of view is continually getting wrong he is continually seeing worries where he ought to see material he may notice for instance a patch on the back of his head and he wonders whether it is the result of age or of disease or whether it has always been there and his wife tells him he must call at the chemist's and satisfy himself at once frightful nuisance age the endless trouble of a capillary complaint calling at the chemist's will make him late at the office etc etc but then his skilled efficient brain intervenes what peculiarly interesting material this mean and petty circumstance yields for the practice of philosophy and right living and again is this to ruffle you o oh my soul will it serve any end whatever that i should buzz nervously round this circumstance instead of attending to my usual business i give this as an example of the necessity of adjusting the point of view 
and of the manner in which a brain habituated by suitable concentration to correct thinking will come to the rescue in unexpected contingencies naturally it will work with greater certainty in the manipulation of difficulties that are expected that can be seen coming and preparation for the expected is fortunately preparation for the unexpected the man who commences his day by a steady contemplation of the dangers which the next sixteen hours are likely to furnish and by arming himself specially against those dangers has thereby armed himself though to a less extent against dangers which he did not dream of but the routine must be fairly elastic it may be necessary to commence several days in succession for a week or for months even with disciplining the brain in one particular detail to the temporary neglect of other matters it is astonishing how you can weed every inch of a garden path and keep it in the most meticulous order and then one morning find in the very middle of it a lusty full-grown plant whose roots are positively mortised in granite all gardeners are familiar with such discoveries but a similar discovery though it entails hard labour on him will not disgust the man whose hobby is his brain for the discovery in itself is part of the material out of which he has to live if a man is to turn everything whatsoever into his own calm dignity and happiness he must make this use even of his own failures he must look at them as phenomena of the brain in that box and cheerfully set about taking measures to prevent their repetition all that happens to him success or check will but serve to increase his interest in the contents of that box i seem to hear you saying and a fine egotist he'll be well he'll be the right sort of egotist the average man is not half enough of an egotist if egotism means a terrific interest in oneself egotism is absolutely essential to efficient living there is no getting away from that but if egotism means selfishness the serious student of the craft of daily living will not be an egotist for more than about a year in a year he will have proved the ineptitude of egotism End of chapter 12。Chapter 13 of The Human Machine by Arnold Bennett。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 13 。Success and Failure。I am sadly aware that these brief chapters will be apt to convey, especially to the trustful and enthusiastic reader, a false impression the impression of simplicity and that when experience has roughly corrected this impression the said reader unless he is most solemnly warned may abandon the entire enterprise in a fit of disgust and for ever afterwards maintain a cynical and impolite attitude towards all theories of controlling the human machine now the enterprise is not a simple one it is based on one simple principle the conscious discipline of the brain by selected habits of thought but it is just about as complicated as anything well could be advanced golf is child's play compared to it the man who briefly says to himself i will get up at eight and from eight thirty to nine i will examine and control my brain and so my life will at once be instantly improved out of recognition that man is destined to unpleasant surprises progress will be slow progress may appear to be quite rapid at first and then a period of futility may set in and the would-be vanquisher of his brain may suffer a series of the most deadly defeats and in his pessimism he may imagine that all his pains have gone for nothing and that the unserious loungers in exhibition gardens and readers of novels in parlours are in the right of it after all he may even feel rather ashamed of himself for having been as he thinks taken in by specious promises like the purchaser of a quack medicine the conviction that great effort has been made and no progress achieved is the chief of the dangers that affront the beginner in machine tending 
it is i will assert positively in every case a conviction unjustified by the facts and usually it is the mere result of reaction after fatigue encouraged by the instinct for laziness i do not think it will survive an impartial examination but i know that a man in order to find an excuse for abandoning further effort is capable of convincing himself that past effort has yielded no fruit at all so curious is the human machine i beg every student of himself to consider this remark with all the intellectual honesty at his disposal it is a grave warning when the machine tender observes that he is frequently changing his point of view when he notices that what he regarded as the kernel of the difficulty yesterday has sunk to a triviality to-day being replaced by a fresh phenomenon when he arises one morning and by means of a new unexpected glimpse into the recesses of the machine perceives that hitherto he has been quite wrong and must begin again when he wonders how on earth he could have been so blind and so stupid as not to see what now he sees when the new vision is veiled by new disappointments and narrowed by continual reservations when he is overwhelmed by the complexity of his undertaking then let him enhearten himself for he is succeeding the history of success in any art and machine tending is an art is a history of recommencements of the dispersal and reforming of doubts of an ever-increasing conception of the extent of the territory unconquered and an ever-decreasing conception of the extent of the territory conquered it is remarkable that though no enterprise could possibly present more diverse and changeful excitements than the mastering of the brain the second great danger which threatens its ultimate success is nothing but a mere drying up of enthusiasm for it one would have thought that in an affair which concerned him so nearly in an affair whose results might be in a very strict sense vital to him in an affair upon which his happiness and misery might certainly turn a man would not weary from sheer tedium nevertheless it is so again and again i have noticed the abandonment temporary or permanent of this mighty and thrilling enterprise from simple lack of interest and i imagine that in practically all cases save those in which an exceptional original force of will renders the enterprise scarcely necessary the interest in it will languish unless it is regularly nourished from without now the interest in it cannot be nourished from without by means of conversation with other brain tamers there are certain things which may not be discussed by sanely organized people and this is one the affair is too intimate and it is also too moral even after only a few minutes vocalization on this subject a deadly infection seems to creep into the air the infection of priggishness or am i mistaken and do i fancy this horror no i cannot believe that i am mistaken hence the nourishment must be obtained by reading a little reading every day i suppose there are some thousands of authors who have written with more or less sincerity on the management of the human machine but the two which for me stand out easily above all the rest are marcus aurelius antoninus and epictetus not much has been discovered since their time the perfecting of life is a power residing in the soul wrote marcus aurelius in the ninth book of to himself over seventeen hundred years ago marcus aurelius is assuredly regarded as the greatest of writers in the human machine school and not to read him daily is considered by many to be a bad habit as a confession his work stands alone but as a practical bradshaw of existence i would put the discourses of epictetus before marcus aurelius epictetus is grosser he will call you a blockhead as soon as look at you he is witty he is even humorous and he never wanders far away from the incidents of daily life 
he is brimming over with actuality for readers of the year 1908. He was a freed slave. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor, and he had the morbidity from which all emperors must suffer. A finer soul than Epictetus, he is not, in my view, so useful a companion. Not all of us can breathe freely in his atmosphere. Nevertheless, he is, of course, to be read and re-read continually. When you have gone through Epictetus, a single page or paragraph per day, well masticated and digested, suffices. You can go through Marcus Aurelius, and then you can return to Epictetus, and so on, morning by morning or night by night, till your life's end, and they will conserve your interest in yourself. In the matter of concentration, I hesitate to recommend Mrs. Annie Besant's thought power, and yet I should be possibly unjust if I did not recommend it, having regard to its immense influence on myself. It is not one of the best books of this astounding woman. It is addressed to theosophists, and can only be completely understood in the light of theosophistic doctrines. To grasp it all, I found myself obliged to study a much larger work dealing with theosophy as a whole. It contains an appreciable quantity of what strikes me as feeble sentimentalism, and also a lot of sheer dogma, but it is the least unsatisfactory manual of the brain that I have met with, and if the profane reader ignores all that is either Greek or twaddle to him, there will yet remain for his advantage a vast amount of very sound information and advice. All these three books are cheap. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 A Man and His Environment. I now come to an entirely different aspect of the whole subject. Hitherto I have dealt with the human machine as a contrivance for adapting the man to his environment. My aim has been to show how much depends on the machine and how little depends on the environment, and that the essential business of the machine is to utilise, for making the stuff of life, the particular environment in which it happens to find itself, and no other. All this, however, does not imply that one must accept, fatalistically and permanently and passively, any preposterous environment into which destiny has chanced to throw us, if we carry far enough the discipline of our brains, we can, no doubt, arrive at surprisingly good results in no matter what environment. But it would not be right reason to expend an excessive amount of willpower on brain discipline when a slighter effort in a different direction would produce consequences more felicitous. A man whom fate had pitched into a canal might accomplish miracles in the way of rendering himself amphibian, he might stagger the world by the spectacle of his philosophy under amazing difficulties. People might pay sixpence a head to come and see him, but he would be less of a nincompoop if he climbed out and arranged to live definitely on the bank. The advantage of an adequate study of the control of the machine such as I have outlined is that it enables the student to judge with some certainty whether the unsatisfactoriness of his life is caused by a disordered machine or by an environment for which the machine is in its fundamental construction unsuitable it does help him to decide justly whether in the case of a grave difference between them he or the rest of the universe is in the wrong and also if he decides that he is not in the wrong it helps him to choose a new environment, or to modify the old, upon some scientific principle. The vast majority of people never know, with any precision, why they are dissatisfied with their sojourn on this planet. They make long and fatiguing excursions in search of precious materials which all the while are concealed in their own breasts. They don't know what they want. They only know that they want something. Or, if they contrive to settle in their own minds what they do want, 
a hundred to one the obtaining of it will leave them just as far off contentment as they were at the beginning this is a matter of daily observation that people are frantically engaged in attempting to get hold of things which by universal experience are hideously disappointing to those who have obtained possession of them and still the struggle goes on and probably will go on all because brains are lying idle it is no trifle that is at stake said epictetus as to the question of control of instinct by reason it means are you in your senses or are you not in this significance indubitably the vast majority of people are not in their senses otherwise they would not behave as they do so vaguely so happy-go-luckily so blindly but the man whose brain is in working order emphatically is in his senses and when a man by means of the efficiency of his brain has put his reason in definite command over his instincts he at once sees things in a truer perspective than was before possible and therefore he is able to set a just value upon the various parts which go to make up his environment if for instance he lives in london and is aware of constant friction he will be led to examine the claims of london as a mecca for intelligent persons he may say to himself there is something wrong and the seat of trouble is not in the machine london compels me to tolerate dirt darkness ugliness strain tedious daily journeyings and general expensiveness what does london give me in exchange and he may decide that as london offers him nothing special in exchange except the glamour of london and an occasional seat at a good concert or a bad play he may get a better return for his expenditure of brains nerves and money in the provinces he may perceive with a certain french novelist that most people of truly distinguished mind prefer the provinces and he may then actually in obedience to reason quit the deceptions of london with a tranquil heart sure of his diagnosis whereas a man who had not devoted much time to the care of his mental machinery could not screw himself up to the step partly from lack of resolution and partly because he had never examined the sources of his unhappiness a man who not having full control of his machine is consistently dissatisfied with his existence is like a man who is being secretly poisoned and cannot decide with what or by whom and so he has no middle course between absolute starvation and a continuance of poisoning as with the environment of place so with the environment of individuals most friction between individuals is avoidable friction sometimes however friction springs from such deep causes that no skill in the machine can do away with it but how is the man whose brain is not in command of his existence to judge whether the unpleasantness can be cured or not whether it arises in himself or in the other he simply cannot judge whereas a man who keeps his brain for use and not for idle amusement will when he sees that friction persists in spite of his brain be so clearly impressed by the advisability of separation as the sole cure that he will steel himself to the effort necessary for a separation one of the chief advantages of an efficient brain is that an efficient brain is capable of acting with firmness and resolution partly of course because it has been toned up but more because its operations are not confused by the interference of mere instincts thirdly there is the environment of one's general purpose in life which is i feel convinced far more often hopelessly wrong and futile than either the environment of situation or the environment of individuals i will be bold enough to say that quite seventy per cent of ambition is never realized at all and that ninety nine per cent of all realized ambition is fruitless in other words that a gigantic sacrifice of the present to the future is always going on 
and here again the utility of brain discipline is most strikingly shown. A man whose first business it is every day to concentrate his mind on the proper performance of that particular day must necessarily conserve his interest in the present. It is impossible that his perspective should become so warped that he will devote, say, fifty-five years of his career to problematical preparations for his comfort and his glory during the final ten years. A man whose brain is his servant, and not his lady help or his pet dog, will be in receipt of such daily content and satisfaction that he will early ask himself the question, as for this ambition that is eating away my hours, what will it give me that I have not already got? Further, the steady development of interest in the hobby, call it, of common sense daily living, will act as an automatic test of any ambition. If an ambition survives and flourishes on the top of that daily cultivation of the machine, then the owner of the ambition may be sure that it is a genuine and an invincible ambition, and he may pursue it in full faith. His developed care for the present will prevent him from making his ambition an altar on which the whole of the present is to be offered up. I shall be told that I want to do away with ambition, and that ambition is the great motive power of existence, and that therefore I am an enemy of society and the truth is not in me. But I do not want to do away with ambition. What I say is that current ambitions usually result in disappointment, that they usually mean the complete distortion of a life. This is an incontestable fact, and the reason of it is that ambitions are chosen either without knowledge of their real value or without knowledge of what they will cost. A disciplined brain will at once show the unnecessariness of most ambitions and will ensure that the remainder shall be conducted with reason. It will also convince its possessor that the ambition to live strictly according to the highest common sense during the next twenty-four hours is an ambition that needs a lot of beating. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen LSD. Anybody who really wishes to talk simple truth about money at the present time is confronted by a very serious practical difficulty. He must put himself in opposition to the overwhelming body of public opinion and resign himself to being regarded either as a poseur, a crank, or a fool. The public is in search of happiness now, as it was a million years ago. Money is not the principal factor in happiness. It may be argued whether, as a factor in happiness, money is of twentieth-rate importance or fiftieth-rate importance, but it cannot be argued whether money, in point of fact, does or does not of itself bring happiness. There can be no doubt whatever that money does not bring happiness. Yet, in face of this incontrovertible and universal truth, the whole public behaves exactly as if money were the sole or the principal preliminary to happiness. The public does not reason, and it will not listen to reason. Its blood is up in the money hunt, and the philosopher might as well expostulate with an earthquake as try to take that public by the buttonhole and explain. If a man sacrifices his interest under the will of some dead social tyrant in order to marry whom he wishes, if an English minister of religion declines $25,000 a year to go into exile and preach to New York millionaires, the phenomenon is genuinely held to be so astounding that it at once flies right round the world in the form of exclamatory newspaper articles. In an age when such an attitude towards money is sincere, it is positively dangerous, I doubt if it may not be harmful, to persist with loud obstinacy that money, instead of being the greatest, is the least thing in the world. 
in times of high military excitement a man may be ostracized if not lynched for uttering opinions which everybody will accept as truisms a couple of years later and thus the wise philosopher holds his tongue lest it should be cut out so at the zenith of a period when the possession of money in absurd masses is an infallible means to the general respect i have no intention either of preaching or of practising quite all that i privately believe in the matter of riches it was not always thus though there have been previous ages as lustful for wealth and ostentation as our own there have also been ages when money-getting and millionaire envying were not the sole preoccupations of the average man and such an age will undoubtedly succeed to ours few things would surprise me less in social life than the upspringing of some anti-luxury movement the formation of some league or guild among the middling classes where alone intellect is to be found in quantity the members of which would bind themselves to stand aloof from all the great silly banal ugly and tedious lux activities of the time and not to spend more than a certain sum per annum on eating drinking covering their bodies and being moved about like parcels from one spot of the earth's surface to another such a movement would and will help towards the formation of an opinion which would condemn lavish expenditure on personal satisfactions as bad form however the shareholders of grand hotels restaurants and racecourses of all sorts together with popular singers and barristers etc need feel no immediate alarm the movement is not yet as touching the effect of money on the efficient ordering of the human machine there is happily no necessity to inform those who have begun to interest themselves in the conduct of their own brains that money counts for very little in that paramount affair nothing that really helps towards perfection costs more than is within the means of every person who reads these pages the expenses connected with daily meditation with the building up of mental habits with the practice of self-control and of cheerfulness with the enthronement of reason over the rabble of primeval instincts these expenses are really you know trifling and whether you get that well-deserved rise of a pound a week or whether you don't you may anyhow go ahead with the machine it isn't a motor-car though i started by comparing it to one and even when having to a certain extent mastered through sensible management of the machine the art of achieving a daily content and dignity you come to the embroidery of life even the best embroidery of life is not absolutely ruinous meat may go up in price it has done but books won't admission to picture galleries and concerts and so forth will remain quite low the views from richmond hill or hindhead or along pall mall at sunset the smell of the earth the taste of fruit and of kisses these things are unaffected by the machinations of trusts and the hysteria of stock exchanges travel which after books is the finest of all embroideries and which is not to be valued by the mile but by the quality is decidedly cheaper than ever it was all that is required is ingenuity in one's expenditure and much ingenuity with a little money is vastly more profitable and amusing than much money without ingenuity and all the while as you read this you are saying with your impatient sneer it's all very well it's all very fine talking but in brief you are not convinced you cannot deracinate that wide-rooted dogma within your soul that more money means more joy i regret it but let me put one question and let me ask you to answer it honestly your financial means are greater now than they used to be are you happier or less discontented than you used to be taking your existence day by day hour by hour judging it by the mysterious feel in the chest 
of responsibilities, worries, positive joys and satisfactions, are you genuinely happier than you used to be? I do not wish to be misunderstood. The financial question cannot be ignored. If it is true that money does not bring happiness, it is no less true that the lack of money induces a state of affairs in which efficient living becomes doubly difficult. These two propositions, superficially perhaps self-contradictory, are not really so. A modest income suffices for the fullest realisation of the ego in terms of content and dignity, but you must live within it. You cannot righteously ignore money. A man, for instance, who cultivates himself and instructs a family of daughters in everything except the ability to earn their own livelihood, and then has the impudence to die suddenly without leaving a penny, that man is a scoundrel. Ninety, or should I say ninety-nine, per cent of all those anxieties which render proper living almost impossible are caused by the habit of walking on the edge of one's income, as one might walk on the edge of a precipice. The majority of Englishmen have some financial worry or other continually, everlastingly, at the back of their minds. The sacrifice necessary to abolish this condition of things is more apparent than real. All spending is a matter of habit. Speaking generally, a man can contrive, out of an extremely modest income, to have all that he needs, unless he needs the esteem of snobs. Habit may, and habit usually does, make it just as difficult to keep a family on two thousand a year as on two hundred. I suppose that for the majority of men the suspension of income for a single month would mean either bankruptcy, the usurer, or acute inconvenience. Impossible under such circumstances to be in full and independent possession of one's immortal soul. Hence I should be inclined to say that the first preliminary to a proper control of the machine is the habit of spending decidedly less than one earns or receives. The veriest automaton of a clerk ought to have the wherewithal of a whole year as a shield against the caprices of his employer. It would be as reasonable to expect the inhabitants of an unfortified city in the midst of a plain occupied by a hostile army to apply themselves successfully to the study of logarithms or metaphysics as to expect a man without a year's income in his safe to apply himself successfully to the true art of living. And the whole secret of relative freedom from financial anxiety lies not in income but in expenditure. I am ashamed to utter this antique platitude, but, like most aphorisms of unassailable wisdom, it is completely ignored. You say, of course, that it is not easy to leave a margin between your expenditure and your present income. I know it. I fraternally shake your hand. Still, it is, in most cases, far easier to lessen one's expenditure than to increase one's income without increasing one's expenditure. The alternative is before you. However you decide, be assured that the foundation of philosophy is a margin, and that the margin can always be had. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen Reason, Reason. In conclusion, I must insist upon several results of what I may call the intensive culture of the reason. The brain will not only grow more effectively powerful in the departments of life where the brain is supposed specially to work but it will also enlarge the circle of its activities. It will assuredly interfere in everything. The student of himself must necessarily conduct his existence more and more according to the views of his brain. This will be most salutary and agreeable both for himself and for the rest of the world. You object. You say it will be a pity when mankind refers everything to reason. 
you talk about the heart you envisage an entirely reasonable existence as a harsh and callous existence not so when the reason and the heart come into conflict the heart is invariably wrong i do not say that the reason is always entirely right but i do say that it is always less wrong than the heart the empire of the reason is not universal but within its empire reason is supreme and if other forces challenge it on its own soil they must take the consequences nearly always when the heart opposes the brain the heart is merely a pretty name which we give to our idleness and our egotism we pass along the strand and see a respectable young widow standing in the gutter with a baby in her arms and a couple of boxes of matches in one hand we know she is a widow because of her weeds and we know she is respectable by her clothes we know she is not begging because she is selling matches the sight of her in the gutter pains our heart our heart weeps and gives the woman a penny in exchange for a halfpenny box of matches and the pain of our heart is thereby assuaged our heart has performed a good action but later on our reason unfortunately asleep at the moment wakes up and says that baby was hired the weeds and matches merely a dodge the whole affair was a spectacle got up to extract money from a fool like you it is as mechanical as a penny in the slot instead of relieving distress you have simply helped to perpetuate an infamous system you ought to know that you can't do good in that off-hand way the heart gives pennies in the street the brain runs the charity organization society of course to give pennies in the street is much less trouble than to run the cos as a method of producing a quick inexpensive and pleasing effect on one's egotism the cos is simply not in it with this dodge of giving pennies at random without inquiry only which of the two devices ought to be accused of harshness and callousness which of them is truly kind i bring forward the respectable young widow as a sample case of the heart v brain conflict all other cases are the same the brain is always more kind than the heart the brain is always more willing than the heart to put itself to a great deal of trouble for a very little reward the brain always does the difficult unselfish thing and the heart always does the facile showy thing naturally the result of the brain's activity on society is always more advantageous than the result of the heart's activity another point i have tried to show that if the reason is put in command of the feelings it is impossible to assume an attitude of blame towards any person whatsoever for any act whatsoever the habit of blaming must depart absolutely it is no argument against this statement that it involves anarchy and the demolition of society even if it did which emphatically it does not that would not affect its truth all great truths have been assailed on the ground that to accept them meant the end of everything as if that mattered as i make no claim to be the discoverer of this truth i have no hesitation in announcing it to be one of the most important truths that the world has yet to learn however the real reason why many people object to this truth is not because they think it involves the utter demolition of society fear of the utter demolition of society never stopped any one from doing or believing anything and never will but because they say to themselves that if they can't blame they can't praise and they do so like praising if they are so desperately fond of praising it is a pity that they don't praise a little more there can be no doubt that the average man blames much more than he praises his instinct is to blame if he is satisfied he says nothing if he is not he most illogically kicks up a row 
so that even if the suppression of blame involved the suppression of praise, the change would certainly be a change for the better. But I can perceive no reason why the suppression of blame should involve the suppression of praise. On the contrary, I think that the habit of praising should be fostered. I do not suggest the occasional use of trowels, but the regular use of salt spoons. Anyhow, the triumph of the brain over the natural instincts. In an ideally organized man, the brain and the natural instincts will never have even a tiff. Always means the ultimate triumph of kindness. And further, the culture of the brain, the constant disciplinary exercise of the reasoning faculty, means the diminution of misdeeds. Do not imagine I am hinting that you are on the verge of murdering your wife or breaking into your neighbour's house. Although you personally are guiltless, there is a good deal of sin still committed in your immediate vicinity. Said Balzac in La Cousine Bette, a crime is in the first instance a defect of reasoning powers. In the appreciation of this truth, Marcus Aurelius was, as usual, a bit beforehand with Balzac. Marcus Aurelius said, No soul willfully misses truth. And Epictetus had come to the same conclusion before Marcus Aurelius, and Plato before Epictetus. All wrongdoing is done in the sincere belief that it is the best thing to do. Whatever sin a man does, he does either for his own benefit or for the benefit of society. At the moment of doing it, he is convinced that it is the only thing to do. He is mistaken, and he is mistaken because his brain has been unequal to the task of reasoning the matter out. Passion, the heart, is responsible for all crimes. Indeed, crime is simply a convenient monosyllable which we apply to what happens when the brain and the heart come into conflict and the brain is defeated. That transaction of the matches was a crime, you know. Lastly, the culture of the brain must result in the habit of originally examining all the phenomena of life and conduct to see what they really are and to what they lead. The heart hates progress, because the dear old thing always wants to do as has always been done. The heart is convinced that custom is a virtue. The heart of the dirty working man rebels when the state insists that he shall be clean, for no other reason than that it is his custom to be dirty. Useless to tell his heart that clean he will live longer. He has been dirty and he will be. The brain alone is the enemy of prejudice and precedent, which alone are the enemies of progress. And this habit of originally examining phenomena is perhaps the greatest factor that goes to the making of personal dignity, for it fosters reliance on oneself and courage to accept the consequences of the act of reasoning. Reason is the basis of personal dignity. I finish. I have said nothing of the modifications which the constant use of the brain will bring about in the general value of existence. Modifications slow and subtle, but tremendous. The persevering will discover them. It will happen to the persevering that their whole lives are changed texture and colour too. Naught will happen to those who do not persevere. End of the Human Machine by Arnold Bennett Recording by Ruth Golding Golding.wordpress.com August 2012